Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines in partnership with Christ's Commission Fellowship bring you a message from the Word. Now today, we will continue our discussion on the book of Romans. We are going to discuss the reality of the bad news. Last Sunday, good news. Remember, good news? Gospel. Today, bad news. I don't like bad news. But is it important? If the bad news is true, is it important to know the bad news? Why? You see, bad news, deny or do something about it. Am I correct? When you hear bad news, you have two choices. Deny or do something about it. Now, today, I want to give you the bad news. You know why? You will never appreciate the good news until you know the bad news. C.S. Lewis once said the following. He said, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. If you want a religion to make you feel good, then, my friend, it is not about Christianity. It is something else. So, what is the bad news? The bad news today is about the reality of the wrath of God. Now, what enters your mind when you think of the wrath of God? Anybody? The wrath of God. The wrath of God for many people, even Christians today, is something we are reluctant to discuss or you feel apologetic about it. Why? Why is this topic not popular? The wrath of God. Well, let me tell you. Because for many of us, we think it's a moral blemish of God. That God being loving, being perfect, God should not have wrath. He should never be angry. It's called wrong theology. You need to believe right theology based on the Bible. If not, you and I will be in trouble. Many people think it is not consistent with his character. We want a God that is only loving, caring, forgiving. But you know what's the truth? There are more Bible verses on the wrath of God than on His love and mercy. Let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18, together. Together. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So this is from God. The wrath of God is righteous. You know why it's righteous? It is directed against everybody, all ungodliness, and unrighteousness. Ungodliness is your relationship with God. For many people, we don't care about God. We put God aside. Ungodliness. We don't honor Him. You don't give Him His proper due. We take Him for granted. Worst of all, rebellion against God. The word unrighteousness deals with our relationship with one another. Unrighteousness. We cheat on each other. We curse each other. We take advantage of, of uh, all kinds of material things to take advantage of others. That's what it meant by unrighteousness. Slander people, kill people, malice. Now, this is the root problem. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness? The word suppress, you suppress the truth, means you got to have the truth first. How can you suppress something if you don't have the truth? Now, be honest with me. How do, we, how do people suppress the truth? I was asking a man once, he's a leader. I said, how did you teach Bible and at the same time commit adultery? How, how do you manage to do that? You know what he tells me? He said, I just refuse to think about God. I just suppress it. So for some people, they want their minds to be so busy 
thinking of other things, but they don't want to think about what God's Spirit is telling them. Hey, there's a God. You need to listen to Him. So what, what do we do? We get busy. We, we go out with friends. We do all kinds of stuff to suppress the truth. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, first, let me tell you the outline of today's message. Very simple. The outline of today's message is God's wrath is righteous. Number two, it is real. And number three, it is redemptive. So today, you will understand the wrath of God based on the Bible. Number one, it is righteous. Number two, it is real. Number three, it is redemptive. Now, when we say the wrath of God, what do we mean? Here's the definition. The wrath of God is the indignation and anger of God against evil. It is the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. Let me repeat. What is the wrath of God? It is the holy indignation, the deep anger of God against evil. It is His holiness, the holiness of God, is stirred up against sin. That is something you need to understand. The wrath of God is not capricious. The wrath of God is part of God's perfect character. What do we mean? The wrath of God is part of God's perfect character. Meaning, because God is perfect. And part of that perfection involves wrath. What do you mean? However, there would be blemish or defect if wrath against evil is absent. Can you imagine a president of a country who will tolerate evil? Can you imagine a leader that will tolerate injustice? How can that be a good person? Such is God. He is good. And because he is good, he is going to take action against evil. It's something you need to understand. I love this saying, the reality of let's read this quotation, all right? Sometimes this is a CCF quotation. He who is indifferent to sin, injustice, and evil cannot be called good. So you cannot be indifferent. The wrath of God, let me repeat, is not like men. It's not like people where you lose your temper, you're out of control. That is never the wrath of God. The wrath of God is very predictable. He tells you what he's angry at. He tells you how to solve your problem. So let's look at the wrath of God that will give you comfort. What do I mean? Romans chapter 1 or Romans chapter 12. I like Romans chapter 12 verse 19. Let's read this together. Everybody. Never take your own revenge. You know, sometimes you see injustice. Sometimes bad people will do certain things against you, against family. Or you, you look at the world. You see a lot of foolishness going on. And we get angry. Why do you get angry? You see, it's called righteous anger. Why do you get angry? Because something in us tells us something is wrong. Now, the Bible says, never take your own revenge. Never. Beloved, Leave room for the wrath of God. See, the wrath of God is real. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So ladies and gentlemen, if you see bad things happening today, you, you need to understand, God knows. And there will be a day of reckoning. If people take advantage of you, you go to God. But God knows what's happening. You can rest in the justice of God. God's wrath someday will be manifested. Let us look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18, 19, one more time. The wrath of God is righteous. It is against all ungodliness. Next, why? Why is God angry at unrighteousness, at ungodliness? He gives you the reason now. Because, everybody read, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident. Have you heard of this discussion? What about those people who have not heard the gospel? What about those people who live before Christ? Well, the Bible is clear. God made it evident 
for the entire world to know that there's a God that He exists. That's reality. Notice the Bible is very explicit. Number one, it is evident within them. Number two, God made it evident. Now, how did God reveal? How did God reveal Himself? Well, let's find out. Look at Romans chapter one, verse twenty. Everybody, read together. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. The Bible says if you look at the stars, the moon, the skies, the butterfly, the birds, nature, you know for a fact somebody made it. And that person is God. That's what the Bible is saying. Because if you do not mind, look at Psalm 19 verse 1. Psalm 19 verse 1 tells us, the heavens are telling the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Do you know the heavens gives you a story of who God is? Their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Let me, let me explain this to you. When the Bible was written, they don't have the Hubble telescope. They don't, they don't have super microscope. But God is already saying, just by looking at nature, you know there's a God. Today, 21st century, what have scientists concluded? Are you aware? There are many things. But since this is not going to be a scientific course, I'm just going to share with you a few things that I want to share with you. Number one, the universe right now, even you're an atheist, have already concluded the universe had a beginning. They call it the Big Bang. Why? Because if you look at the stars, they're all expanding outward. So the Big Bang is telling us, everybody, just look at me. Don't worry about the nice picture there, but I love this nice picture, all right? If something started some time ago, my question is this, how did it get started? How can something come from nothing? Remember that song? Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing. You, you guys are too young to know that, those songs, right? But the reality is this. The universe got started. Now explain to me. How did it begin? Ah, okay. All kinds of theory. The next principle I'd like you to know, why the creation tells us there's a God. It's called the law of biogenesis. What is the law of biogenesis? It is scientific law versus scientific theory. Let me repeat. Scientific laws, if you study them, will prove there's a God. Scientific theory, these are theory. It's something else. Scientific law. Biogenesis. Life must come from life. That's a law. It's proven. It's repeated. Life cannot come from non-life. You cannot come from... Where did we come from? I remember in China, I was witnessing. Somebody said, no, no, we, we came from monkey. He does not believe in God. He was very sincere. I said, okay. I teach you how to discuss without getting angry. Sir, where did the monkey come from? So I let him talk. After a while, I said, now, he talks about the plants, the trees, monkey, all of us, the lizard, whatever. I said, now, where did that come from? Then he looked at me. Ah, I never thought about it. He never thought about it. How did something no life becomes a living cell? And how would the cell suddenly multiply? Aha, uh -huh. my friend, they've discovered DNA. You know DNA? DNA is so complex. Okay? Your body has a lot of DNA. Every single cell has DNA. Our body has around three, three trillion cells. Now, if you combine the DNA of your body and you stretch it out, it will go from here 
to the sun and come back, go back, come back. That is how complicated the human cell is. DNA is simply what? Information technology that tells your cell what to do. Produce the eyes, black hair, brown skin. The DNA is the one telling the cell what to do, what to reproduce. Now, where did that information come from? You see, there must be somebody who imported the technology. It cannot come from non-life. And lastly, I want to share with you the principle of the fine-tuning of the universe. Are you familiar with the fine-tuning of the universe? Do you know the distance between the Earth and the Sun? 93 what? Do you know the, the distance? How many light years away? Go back to your Google, and then you can research how far is the Earth. 93 million miles. The moon is what? So many miles away. Can I tell you something? Don't laugh at what I'm saying. If the Earth is closer to the sun, just by a little bit, what will happen? Life will not survive. It's farther away from the sun. We'll freeze to death. It has to be precise. The distance between the Earth and the moon has to be precise. For, for waves, for the sea, so that there is cleansing of the river, cleansing of the sea. In other words, everything has to be precise. Oxygen, air, I praise God, it's free. But do you know our atmosphere, how many percent oxygen? Excuse me? 23%. How many percent nitrogen? Do you, do you know? All right. You'll go to your Google and research. But the ratio has to be precise. If you have more oxygen in the atmosphere, what will happen? Every time there's a lightning, the automatic, the earth will burn. Too much oxygen is not good. It will cause fire. Too little oxygen, you won't survive. Now, can you imagine everything is so precise? My favorite is gravity. Do you know that the cell within the cell has certain gravity? It has forces. So let me ask you a question. What if you adjust the gravity by 0 0.0001%? According to scientists, you cannot even adjust it by 0.01%, not even 0.001%, not even 0.0001%. If you adjust gravity, the universe will not exist. It will either go apart or it will collapse. Everything has to be precise. Now, these are scientific, okay? Based on science. So what's our problem? The problem is this. Let me just share with you quickly. What's our problem? The problem is simply this. We did not honor God even knowing that He exists. You see, ingratitude toward God is one of the worst sins you can ever develop. Let me repeat. Ingratitude against God and against people is very shocking. Can I ask you a question? Have you seen people with no gratitude? They don't appreciate what others have done for them. In Tagalog, what do you call that? No gratitude. Walang utang na loob. Now, let me ask you. People with no gratitude, which is worse? Immoral people, cheater, liar, or people who are ungrateful? Think about it. Look at this verse. Even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. Or give thanks. Do you honor God? How do you honor God? Do you take Him seriously? Do you worship Him? Do you have gratitude toward God? That's the idea here. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. You see the progression? By not honoring God, something happens to our heart. Something happens to our mind. Professing to be wise, they became fools. That's why you have the word moron. No logic in their thinking. Exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. What is the Bible saying? Well, the Bible is saying that 
because of us not honoring God, something happened to our mind. Let me share with you what this famous atheist said, George Ward. You know, you know what he said? George Ward said, okay, a Nobel Prize winner. This is what he said. I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible, spontaneous generation arising to evolution. Here is a scientist who agreed the theory of evolution. Is, I'm not talking about microevolution. I'm talking about the real evolution from non-life to life. He's saying it is scientifically impossible. And yet they still believe in it. Why? My friend, that's the meaning of darkened heart, darkened mind. Because the reality is this. You choose to believe what you want to believe. And many times our moral life impacts our faith. You justify your belief based on your morality. Look at what R.C. Sproul said. R.C. Sproul said the following. He said, The main problem with those who deny the existence of God is not intellectual. It is because of insufficient, it is not because of insufficient information. It is not because God's manifestation of himself in nature has been obscured. What is the real reason, everybody? Man's problem with the existence of God is not an intellectual problem. What is it? It's a moral problem. Think about it. Look at Romans 1, 24, 25. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. I'm going to explain this word, God gave them over. This is very important. It is used three times in these verses. God gave them over. What does it mean? I'm going to explain soon so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. You know, the Bible is very clear. Our root sin is not honoring God because we don't honor God. We don't give thanks to Him. The result is what? Idolatry. You see, you and I were designed by God to worship something. Either you worship God or you worship your own man-made God. You see, we have created God in our own image. For some people today, they don't exactly worship God in their image. They worship themselves. But all of you worship something. What do I mean? Whatever, whoever you put your trust and confidence and your hope and your happiness in, that becomes your God. And that's the root problem of humanity. Not realizing who God is, and we have created our own gods. Notice, exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Can I tell you the, the distance between creature and creator? No comparison. Think of the best person. I'm sad today because I see people... They are very sincere. They pray to human beings. They pray to the dead. They pray. Whoever you pray to is, remember, creature versus creator. You must only worship the creator. And who is our creator? The Bible is very clear. Jesus, God, is our creator. You cannot worship any other thing. Therefore, this is what happened to humanity. Because of that, I want you to see the problem of humanity. Look at what happened to us. Because we did not honor God, the spiraling down of, the hum of humanity, of anybody's life. You don't honor God, you go down, idolatry, slowly, darkened heart, darkened mind, perversion, immorality, etc. See, the downward spiral of humanity is very clear. It's in the Bible. So don't be surprised if you see what's happening today. The world is sliding down. It all begins with not honoring God. You want yourself to be God. You go down, spiral down. Idolatry. You begin to worship. Let, let me very candid with many of us. Many of us are what I call Christian atheists. 
What are Christian atheists? They believe in God, but they act and behave as though God is irrelevant. That's a Christian atheist. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. But your life, your behavior tells me you don't exactly believe or you're accountable to Him. Therefore, who are you worshiping? Yourself. The spiral. You make your own rules. You make your own what is right, what is wrong. And that is the problem today. The wrath of God is real and it is righteous. Why? Look at what he's telling us. No excuse. Secondly, I want you to know something. God's wrath is not only righteous, it's real. Let me share with you an example of some verses. The reality of God's wrath. In John chapter 3, verse 36, let's read this together. This is from Jesus, okay? He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son of God shall not see life. But, everybody read, the wrath of God abides. What is this verse saying? The wrath of God is present tense. It's being manifested now. What does it mean? I'm going to share with you in a short while. The wrath of God is not only present tense. The wrath of God is also taught by Jesus in terms of application. He tells us in Luke chapter 12, okay, about the future wrath of God. Let's read this together, everybody. I say to you, my friends, according to Jesus, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Today, the fear of God is not taught anymore. Have you heard a message about the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom? Honestly? You will seldom hear that. But don't worry, we are going to teach that. The wrath of God. When have you heard a message in YouTube that talks about the wrath of God? You see, friends, you've got to know the truth. If you don't know the truth, if you don't know the bad news, how will you take action? How will you do something to avoid the inevitable? The wrath of God is real. Jesus talked about it. The other apostles talked about it. Let's continue reading. Revelation chapter 6. I call this the last prayer of people living on planet Earth. What is the last prayer? Do you know the last prayer? This is the last prayer of people who do not know the Lord. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks. Can you imagine praying to the mountains, praying to the rocks? What is their prayer? Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, the, la the wrath of Jesus. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to survive? Who is able to stand? You see, the wrath of God is real. It's not only present, it's future. The wrath of God is bad news. You can deny it or you can do something about it. Romans chapter 1 chapter 2, chapter 3. Remember, the most systematic theological book. And we are going to go through the entire book of Romans. It begins with the good news. It tells you the bad news. It tells you how to get out of the bad news. So chapter 3, 4, 5 tells us God is going to save us. How? He tells you how. Chapter 6, 7, 8, it tells you how can you live a holy life? So chapter 1, 2, 3, we have a problem, sin. Chapter 3, 4, 5, we are saved, salvation. Chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, sanctification, how to live a holy life, and, and so on. But right now, we are stuck in chapter 1. What is chapter 1? The bad news. What is the bad news? God's wrath is there. It's real. My friend, look at the use of the word God gave them over. Three times. God gave them over. What is that in Tagalog? God gave them over. Let me explain to you in Tagalog. In Tagalog, bahala ka na sa buhay mo. Okay? I tell people, they're very stubborn. Okay. Bahala ka na. Pabayan na kita. 
in English. Up to you. I give you over. You decide what you want to do. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts. You want to keep on doing bad things? That's fine. I give you over. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. God gave them over to a depraved mind. Notice from verse 24 to 28, you have three times. The wrath of God is manifested. How is the wrath of God manifested? I call this divine non-intervention. Instead of intervention, God is saying, okay. God's wrath is manifested when he allows you to do what you want to do with your life. God could have forced his will upon you, but he did not. He's saying, look, you are on your own. You want to reject me? Okay, I leave you alone. And that's what's happening to humanity today. We are on our own. That's how God's wrath is manifested. For example, let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 26. God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, the men abandoned their natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts, receiving in their own passions, the, in their own persons, the penalty of their own error. You know what God is saying? Because of your own choice, you don't want to acknowledge me? All right. I turn you over to your own passion. Remember, idolatry eventually leads to immorality. But the Bible is very explicit. Not just any kind of sexual immorality. The Bible is now talking about what kind of sin is the Bible talking about? It's talking about what? Notice, their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural in the same way the men also. In other words, what kind of sin is this? You call this homosexual, lesbian sin. Remember, the Bible is very explicit. The Bible is very clear. It is wrong. Who said it is wrong? Not me. In CCF, we love all kinds of people. Transgender, homosexual, lesbian. We have one of the biggest ministries in the whole Philippines, if you ask me, to help people with gender confusion. We have compassion for them. Notice what the Bible is saying. You need to have the eyes of God. This is wrong. You got to love the person. Understand? We love everybody. Adulterer, robber, you love the person. But their deeds is something else. God wants to help us. Nothing, it says here. Receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. This is already present tense and future tense. Do you know based on study? This is based on studies. Not by Christian churches, but by secular world. People who are into homosexuality, lesbianism, what do you notice? For a guy, the average partner is 500 men, men to men, average. Very few have less than six. Why? Why? You see, people, they're, we all look for happiness. We look for love. We look for companionship because we are empty. But no amount of relationship, no amount of experimentation will fulfill the emptiness of the soul. And that's why you will see a lot of these people, they commit suicide, they're empty, they're depressed. Friends, have your eyes open to the reality. Speak the truth in love. It is not coming from me. I love all kinds of people. That's why we have in CCF, we have a special ministry dedicated to people with gender confusion. We have a group of people specializing in that ministry. But my point is this. 
God loves us. And God is saying, this is part of the consequences of sin, of a degraded passion, depraved mind. Look at the next verse. You may think God is just speaking on homosexuality and lesbianism. No, look at the next verse. What does it say? As they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, everybody read, God gave them over from the heart to a depraved mind. Bankrupt, corrupt. To do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed. Now, all scholars agreed on one thing. It's very hard to outline this sin. You cannot group them together. They, they are all over the place. So this is really just example of unrighteousness. Example? Now, you say, oh, Peter, I am not a homosexual. I, I don't have gender confusion problem. Ah, uh -uh. What about this one? Greed. Evil. Full of envy. Are you jealous of people? Hatred. Murder. Strife. Deceit. Malice. Gossips. Ladies, ladies, don't raise your hand, but gossip. Have you gossip? Slanderer. Oh, my goodness, slanderer. Telling the truth to people who don't need to hear it. But you are saying, just between us, huh? honest, huh? Tay -tay lang, huh? Ito talaga nangyari. My goodness, you don't need to tell those things to other people, but that's slander. Haters of God. How in the world can you be haters of God? Just look at the news today. Haters of God. Insolent. Arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. My goodness, this is all part of the spiral going downward of men. Continue reading. Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Although they know the ordinance of God, those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, and this is what makes me sad, they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Depraved mind, depraved heart. I will give you more example, all right? Not for you to judge others, for you to examine yourself. Have you heard of this statement? A depraved mind is something like this. I decide what is true for me. I define my own truth. I determine what is right or wrong. You have no right to tell me what is right or wrong. I tell myself what is right or wrong. That, my friend, is the meaning you are making yourself God. Everyone is doing it. So what's wrong? Depraved mind. How can it be wrong if it feels so good? How can it be wrong? Love. How can love be wrong? Now, you have to understand, these are sincere people. But the Bible says the mind has become corrupted. The heart is corrupted. So they cannot see. Now, do you understand why Satan does not want you to read the Bible? Because the Bible tells you the truth. Good news is true. Bad news is true. We are now in the bad news. So, what is God trying to tell you, trying to tell me? God's wrath is not only righteous. It is not only real. It's also redemptive. What do we mean by redemptive? Redemptive means God wants to do something regarding our problem, but He wants you to know your problem is real. You see, our problem is not only are we sinful by choice, but there's coming judgment. And God is saying, I want to save you. So Romans chapter 2, verse 1 and 3 tells us the following. Everybody read. Therefore, you have no excuse. The emphasis is no excuse. In Romans chapter 1, you have no excuse. Don't say you don't know God. God is real. Now remember, God's general revelation is different from God's special, specific revelation. God has revealed himself to us through creation. No excuse. 
And God has revealed to us today through Jesus, through his word. You call that specific revelation. Both are from God. What the author is saying now, everybody, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, you know why? People who may not really know the Bible know what is right and wrong. And because you know what's right and wrong, you can tend to become self-righteous. You judge others. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. You and we know that the judgment of God now, compared to your own judgment, the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. In other words, when you judge people, you may make yourself look better. When you judge people, you may think you are not as guilty as those you judge. I call that projection. But the reality is this. God is saying you are just as guilty. You may not be committing those sins I mentioned about. What about others? So God is saying you are without excuse. Continue reading. But... Do you suppose, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? What the Bible is saying, we have no excuse. So the bad news is, number one, we have turned away from God, and number two, our deeds are sinful. That's the bad news. The wrath of God is real. Why? We have turned away from Him. We have rebelled against Him. And our actions is also wrong. But notice the next verse. I love the next verse, all right? Romans 2, 4 and 5. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? I love the phrase, the riches of his kindness. The Bible does not talk about the riches of God's wrath. No, no, no. It is the riches of God's kindness, the riches of his patience, the riches of his grace. God is rich in that area. Wrath of God is a byproduct of his holiness because sin has to be judged. But the whole purpose of God's wrath that we, you and I are experiencing now, many of us are experiencing emptiness, problem, is to cause us to what? Everybody read Knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. You know, this is what touched my heart. You know what touched my heart? When I discovered that God has been very kind to me. God has been very patient to me. I look at my life. I look at my past. I look at my current life. You know, guys, I'm not perfect. But God is perfect and God is patient. And his patience towards me motivates me to repent. Do you know God loves you? God is patient with you. God is kind with you. But God wants you to do something. He wants us to repent. What do you mean by repentance? Repentance is change in direction. But this is our problem. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart. Notice, stubbornness and unrepentant. There are people today, right here, and those of you who, who are watching us all over the world, it is just possible that you have heard this, you know about this, but your heart is hardened, stubborn, unrepentant. Well, here's the warning to those of you who are unrepentant and who are stubborn. Some of us are even angry at God. Your heart has hardened. You have no more desire for God. Well, this is the reality. The Bible says, everybody read, you are storing up wrath for yourself. In other words, God is saying, my patience toward you is to lead you to repentance. If you refuse to change, you are storing up wrath for yourself. In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, that day is going to come, whether you like it or not. 
But God is saying, today, I like you to repent. So, what is the Bible saying? What is the action point? Well, the action point, if you ask me, for believers, look at Hebrews chapter 10, 26. Everybody, read this together. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Oh, what does that mean? He continues. He's warning people not to keep on sinning willfully. The wrath of God is a warning to take sin seriously and to take God seriously. So what does it say? We know him, referring to God, who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Again, everybody read now, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I've seen people who mock God, who make fun of God, and you know, I feel scared for them. They have no idea what will come in the future. The Bible says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Why? The Bible says God is a consuming fire. The wrath of God is real, my friend, but it is redemptive. Why are you here today? You are here today, not by accident. God loves you. He wants you to hear this message, the bad news. Don't deny it, but do something about it. What is the bad news? The wrath of God. It is righteous. It is what? Right. Righteous. It is real. And it's redemptive. That's what God wants us to do, to change. Redemption comes when we are transformed. And the Bible tells us, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Why you need to come to Jesus? When you come to Jesus and to wait for his son, Jesus, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, the resurrection of Jesus is the proof that he alone can save us, that it's Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. My friend, a future wrath is coming. Not only the wrath that you see now, the wrath that is happening today are the consequences of your own actions. God is allowing you to experience His wrath, the consequences of your unbelief, the consequences of our decision. Yes, God allows it. In Tagalog, bahala ka sa buhay mo. Okay? Are you having pain? Are you having problems? God is saying, I want you to wake up. Gising na! I want you to see what's wrong with your life. You are not happy. You are miserable. Why don't you change? You know, there are some people who are so miserable because they are not right with God. But they think it will just automatically go away. God is saying, I'm waking you up. You are miserable. You are depressed. You are unhappy. Why don't you change? Ah, let me give you a story as we close. Of somebody who experienced the wrath of God, but he changed. Do you know who is that person? That person is famously called the prodigal son. Are you familiar with the story of the prodigal son? He went to his father. He told his father, I want my money now. Telling his father, I wish you die. Give me my money now. And the father gave him his money. And he went. Remember that story? Why did the father allow the son? Ah, bahala ka na sa sariling buhay. You see, God cannot force you to change. But you need to repent. You need to understand what's going on. And this is what the Bible says. In Luke chapter 15, verse 14, notice how the wrath of God is manifested, but in a very subtle way. Look, the consequences of his sin. When he had spent everything, no more money, a severe famine occurred. Notice the timing. A severe famine came. Next. And he began to be, what? Impoverished. He became needy. You see, people will not come to God until they realize, I need help. This guy was impoverished. So he was hired. 
he hired himself out on one of the citizens of that country. He sent him into his fields to feed the swine. Can you imagine a Jew who don't eat pork is now feeding pigs? How low can you get? God allows. He gave them over to their decisions. So this guy is no longer in a good shape. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. No one was giving anything to him. Hallelujah! No one was helping him. Many times you short-circuit God's discipline, God's way by intervening. I'm not saying don't help people, but in this case, I said praise God. Nobody helped him. No one was helping him. Can I tell you why? If somebody had helped him, do you think he will realize what's wrong with him? Can you read the next verse? Okay. When he, noticed, when he came to his senses, what is that in Tagalog? Natauhan. I do not know how to translate that in English. Natauhan. He became a man. No, cannot be. Natauhan. He came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father. That's repentance. Change in direction. And say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. He got up and came to his father. Repentance is you change direction in life. But many will not change until you reach a point of you say, you know what? I need to change. If you don't change, what's going to happen? You are storing up wrath for yourself. And I know everybody here needs repentance. Amen? Notice the heart of God. When that guy stood up, the, the Bible tells us, while he was still a long way, the father saw him and felt compassion, embraced him. That is God the Father. God is saying, if you repent today, if you turn, I will embrace you. And that, my friend, is why I like the story of repentance of the prodigal son. As we close, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Look at our assurance. How much more, having now been justified by his blood, remember the wrath of God was poured on Jesus. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through Jesus. Now, let me ask you. Is God speaking to you? Have you come to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Or are you coming to religion? You see, if you put your faith in religion, you put your faith in people, it will not save you. There's only one way to be saved from the wrath of God. And that is when Jesus died on the cross, he took the wrath of God upon himself. The manifestation of wrath was displayed on the cross. When Jesus suffered for you and for me, to show us the wrath of God against sin. Jesus took your sin. But Jesus is saying, if you come to him today, if you repent, you will be forgiven. You will be saved from the wrath to come. Let's bow our heads. If God has spoken to you, and you have never really understood the good news or the wrath of God, and today you want to repent, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Anybody else? You want to repent. God is speaking to you. I'd like you to pray this prayer with me, wherever you are. Pray this prayer with me from the heart, okay? If you want to experience the forgiveness of God, the salvation of God from His wrath, you pray this prayer wherever you are. Lord Jesus, I realize I'm under judgment. I realize I need to repent. Help me, Jesus, to follow you. I surrender my life to you. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I accept your sacrifice on the cross for my sins. And now I repent. I want to follow you. I accept your gift of forgiveness. I accept your gift of eternal life. Change my heart today. Now, to those of you who have accepted Christ before, 
But today you still need to repent. There is something in your life that is not right. You have Jesus. But God is telling you you need to repent. I don't know what it is. Any sin in your life that you need to repent. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you also. There is something in your life that is not right. And God is saying, will you humble yourself and will you repent? Higher. Yeah. Okay. Lord Jesus, I prayed for this group of men and women, especially those who were convicted by your word that they need to repent of something. It can be immorality. It can be greed. It can be anger. It can be unforgiveness. Whatever it is, ungratefulness, ingratitude, Lord, whatever it is, will you assure them if they repent, they shall experience forgiveness. So help us to experience your sufficiency and all your grace. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You just heard a message from the Word with Christ's Commission Fellowship in partnership with Far East Broadcasting Company Philippines. Until next week, God bless you.